Hello and welcome. This panel is a follow-up to HILT's 2021 conference, Tackling Global Challenges from the Harvard Classroom and Beyond. Today, Harvard faculty from STEM and non-STEM disciplines will share how their students learn about climate change through various lenses. And now, without further ado, let's turn to our panel. Jim, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, so thanks so much, uh, Melissa, for uh, putting this together. And thanks to the team at the office for the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning and the Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching for organizing this event. So let me just remind you another time uh, that if you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box and I'll be monitoring that. The evidence from climate change is mounting. The last summer's heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, the wildfires in California and Australia, the flooding in Germany, and other natural disasters exacerbated by climate change drive home the fact that the consequences of climate change are upon us. And these consequences aren't the new normal. The new normal is that things are going to get worse. And although there's increasing recognition among the public that climate change is anthropogenic, we're not on the aggressive path to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that we must be on to limit the worst damages. At the moment, we're good at making promises about changing behavior and reducing emissions in the distant future. We're less good at taking those actions now. And if anything, <clears throat> at least here in the US, the catastrophe unfolding in Ukraine is increasing calls for production of more fossil fuels, at least from some quarters. Against this backdrop, Harvard has launched an ambitious initiative to increase its efforts in the climate change arena. That initiative has multiple facets, including research, but a key part of that initiative is increasing the amount of teaching and climate here, on climate here at Harvard. Teaching about climate change can be tough, in part because the challenges of climate change span so many disciplines. Of course, a starting point is understanding the basic science of warming and climate change. But beyond that, the field virtually touches virtually every part of academic study, including engineering, the social sciences, and the arts and humanities. At the level of professional education, increasingly many students will engage with either the energy transition or with addressing the harms of climate change in their professional lives. Fortunately, today we are lucky to have a stellar panel to help us identify and perhaps even sort out some of the many challenges that arise in teaching about climate change. Our panelists present many different perspectives on the challenges and teach quite widely varying courses on the topic. In the interest of time, I'll let you read their bios in the chat, or you can just visit their websites. One initiative we've taken this semester is setting up a committee to think about climate education at Harvard across all the different schools. The committee is charged with undertaking where we are now, which is not as easy as it sounds, and where we should be headed, especially uh, uh, specifically what is a vision for educating Harvard students about, evol about the evolving and extremely difficult challenge of climate change. We're lucky to have one of the co-chairs of the committee, Dustin Tingley, with us today. Dustin, I'd like to start with you. I know the committee is working, still working, but would you be able to share a brief summary of some of the issues that the committee is grappling with? Thanks, Jim. Um, so uh, with my co-chair, Missy Holbrook, uh, we have a great team of folks that are, have been working on this, and um, I'll just share some uh, reflections that are kind of coming out of that. You know, one of the things that Jim mentioned um, was the way in which this topic kind of connects across literally every discipline um, at Harvard. And Harvard is in some senses uniquely situated to actually be able to grapple with that multifaceted nature because of the, the amazing breadth of scholarship um, represented across the college and across all the professional schools. So in some senses, we're, we're well equipped for the challenge, but it's a time for us to rise up. So what are some of the things that are, are coming up? You know, at some level, there's a couple just brass tack things. We're not offering enough options in terms of uh, curricular opportunities for our students. Um, uh, they want it, we have faculty that want to offer it, but we're just not there yet. Um, and, you know, part of this um, couples with, uh, we're not yet at a point where we have some degree of coherence. You know, if you're taking um, a course, take my own department, the government department, there's one course on the topic. There is nothing else that I can say to students, hey, if you're interested in this, you can go take more of these things. Um, and so developing both the sort of um, the supply side of this um, and a degree of coherence, I think is gonna be really important for us to think through. 
in that line, I think it's also helpful for us to be um, keeping in mind that um, we have a very diverse faculty and set of curriculum needs. And we do have faculty who want to teach more in this area, but they don't know where to start. They don't know where their voice is. Um, and I think that's a, a huge opportunity to develop. And the last thing we want is essentially a bunch of different classes that are giving the same um, you know, basic science introduction uh, to the topic. And this is what Amanda Claybell, Dean Amanda Claybell calls the 101 problem. Um, you know, we want climate to be featured in, in more courses and whatnot, but we don't want it to be repetitive, right? Um, we want there to be, in a sense, a sort of a real contribution that each course is, is offering, and that's going to take some coordination. But I think, you know, those are just kind of table stakes, Jim. Those are table stakes about where we want to be. Um, where do I see, um, you know, some of the big opportunities emerging? You know, one is literally to take advantage of the whole of Harvard. And by saying that, I don't just mean all of the schools. I don't just mean all the faculty and all the staff. I also mean our alumni and the networks that those alumni are connected to, right? Because these are people um, that have already been out in the world, who are already making a difference, who come with an applied perspective that our students crave. Um, and this is a real opportunity to make and deepen those connections. Um, and so we've been very fortunate to have a very deep level of engagement from the alumni community. I know some of the folks on this call are from the alumni community. And I just want to say we're very thankful for that because the dividends of that thinking um, have, already, uh, have already started to be clearer. And I think that then dovetails into just a desire of many students um, that they want to connect their classrooms to the world, right? Um, they don't want this to be simply something where they're learning um, you know, abstract knowledge, abstract history, et cetera, and then it's completely divorced from um, the things that they're looking at and observing in the world, especially when issues of justice are at hand um, and other challenges due to the multifaceted nature of this issue. Um, and so there's been a number of ideas about how to do that and how to do that in a systematic way um, that also makes sure that those experiences are intellectually grounded, right? This is not just something where we're going to have, um, you know, meaningless internship opportunities, but really opportunities that let people apply the things that they're learning in their coursework um, to challenges and opportunities in the real world and in a meaningful way. Um, and how we architect that and how we institutionalize that, that's gonna be a lot of work, um, but I think that we're uh, afforded with all the right uh, ingredients for success. Um, so I could go on a lot longer Jim, but the work of the committee is really exciting. Um, and I'm really thankful for everyone who's been contributing to it throughout the entire community here at Harvard. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Dustin. And um, I think uh, I think I asked you for a report in the end of May. So I'm you I'm, did. I'm, uh, so I've got <laughs> we've got our work cut out for us. <laughs> yeah, I'm eager. I'm, I'm eager to, to see it. Um, Rob, you're also on the committee. Uh, you teach a course on environmental economics that's cross-listed with the Faculty of Arts and Sciences for undergraduates and at the Kennedy School for master's students. Uh, those students come with pretty different preparations and perspectives. How do you think that works? And do you th what do you think that implies for other possibilities of teaching courses in climate across Harvard schools? So Jim, actually, you know, my experience increasingly is that it works really well because of the fact that these two groups of students are bringing very different skill sets. Uh, the students from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences who are largely concentrators in economics or environmental science and public policy, plus some others as diverse as English literature and physics, um, that they tend to be bringing a by and large, a more technical background, particularly in economics, often in mathematics to it. And they're focused in on learning the economics as well as how it applies to policy. The students from the Kennedy School, on the other hand, are bringing some life experience, probably a less technical approach and much more interest in the policy itself. So what we do in the class, we have study groups that are consist of about six students each with a total of 100 students. And in these study groups that meet weekly, we mix the people together deliberately because they learn from each other, because it's certainly the case in graduate school, but I think also often in undergraduate education that students learn from each other. And so that happens with this group. The, the course has evolved over time. I mean, this course, which uh, goes back 
something like almost 30 years. I must have been 12 years old when I started teaching it. Um, th this course started as what you could think of as a conventional environmental economics course. And it evolved because of student interest, as well as my own interest catching up with the students into a course in climate change policy from the perspective of economics. Those tend to be quite different. And it demonstrates the fact that these courses in general, certainly on a topic like climate change, should change each year. They should evolve over time. And I've already seen ways in which this course will evolve and change for next year when it'll be offered again. That's great. Um, well, I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities to follow up on that. That's really interesting. Um, Mariana, one of the topics that uh, Dustin raised is, uh, active learning or engaged learning uh, in different different forms. I understand you do some of that in your classes. Could you tell us a little bit about that? What do you do? How does it work? What lessons are there for you could share about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I teach two classes about the fundamental science of the atmosphere and ocean. Um, one of them is at the introductory level. And the other one is an upper level class called Climate and Atmospheric Physics Laboratory. Um, I think one of the things that people have recognized is that the world is warming. I think the science is settled on that. But I don't think people appreciate how uncertain many aspects of the impacts are. So I really um, enjoy having the students engage in investigating that by looking at output from climate models. So the, the, the lab is um, about 50% hands-on labs and 50% uh, data and models. So the hands-on labs are looking at fluid flow in a tank. Um, but uh, for this conversation, I'm focus on the modeling aspect. So the, the students actually run climate models and they run climate models with Arctic amplification versus without. And what does that do for local effects? Um, and they can see how much uncertainty there is in how you do the climate modeling and, and what we can actually predict for impacts. So we spend time thinking about the, uh, the full distribution of events. So heat waves and cold snaps are they gonna become more likely? Some models say yes, some models say no. I mean, heat waves, yes, but cold snaps um, are still, still un uncertain. So um, I really enjoy having the students really engage with the IPCC quality models, um, the, the same output that is used to create the, their, the reports um, and I think that's a really good learning experience for them. And then they can look at what they want. They want to see how um, the extremes are different uh, with the Indian monsoon and how that's changing. They have the data, they've learned how to do it and they can look at it. So I really enjoy that um, in, in teaching my class. Oh, that's interesting. You know, you read the IPCC reports or the other studies and they always have these, these um, whatever we would call them fan charts, I guess, in economics about all the different paths going out there. And you always wonder, like, where does all that come from and how do, what sensitivities does that represent? And, and actually having the opportunity to, to do that oneself in real time and understand the, 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 sense of, you know, the parameter sensitivities and so forth. I, that sounds great. That sounds like a really good experience. Um, I teach a freshman seminar in U.S. climate and energy policy, and a challenge that I have in that course is that uh, even to, to get started on the climate on the on the climate policy and the energy policy, you need to understand some of the basics of chemistry and some of the basics of climate science, so that we all have a common vocabulary. Um, the, the thing is, you know, the thing is, that's like, I'm not, I'm an economist and I'm not an earth scientist and I'm not a chemist and I'm, I'm okay with some of the basic chemistry, like, you know, C plus O2 goes to CO2 plus heat. And so that works. But, you know, once we get too far beyond that, I kind of start to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and, and one of the pre-submitted audience questions, it raises this question too, which is how, how do you, 
what, how do you cover the basic stuff for the basic technical stuff of climate science and chemistry, even if that's not the main part of your course, you kind of need to, it seems like you need to touch base, or at least I feel like I need to touch base with it before I move on to the parts that are the main, the main part of the course. Lucas, you must confront this. You teach a gen ed course entitled The Ethics of Climate Change, and there's no prereq for the course. So how do you deal with the, the, the issues of basic, basic climate science and, and chemistry? before you get in there, or how does, how does that fit in? That's a great question, Jim. It's, it's a challenge. It's always been a challenge that I've navigated in different ways in the sort of history of this course. I first started teaching this course in the political science department at MIT. And uh, there I really couldn't have a prerequisite for the course because at MIT, very few students take more than one course in the social sciences or in the humanities. But I could draw on quite a lot of scientific technical expertise and, you know, just literacy. When I moved the course over to Harvard, I, I, um, I, I transformed it into somewhat more of a philosophy and ethics course. And uh, as a result, I think I was able to make it philosophically more difficult, but also the challenge that you just mentioned uh, reared its head. And, and um, you know, it's, it's one that I can see to, 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 to struggle with and and to try to do better with with uh, every year but in order to, to deal with it I, I basically do three things I I first um, make use liberal use of scientific literature that's aimed at a wider audience so books like the physics of climate change by Lawrence Krauss and what we know about climate change by Ma Ma Emmanuel Carey or the case for geoengineering by David Key and things of this kind, often as suggested or recommended readings to supplement my lectures and allow students to read up on some of the, um, the, the science behind what I'm reporting. Second, I make a lot of use of IPCC reports and technical summaries and reports of the International Energy Agency and things like EPA circulars, Congressional Budget Office reports, and in some sections where the economics is central, I simply extract economics textbooks and so on. But that sort of course design and syllabus design, what I really try to do is I, I, I try to, to build in the necessary technical or scientific or economic information into particular subject matters covered in a particular section of the course that raise a particular policy question or ethical dimension. And that allows me to speak to the student um, both in class and in advance and canvas who's working in parts of environmental science or earth science or climate science with faculty at elsewhere since it's a large course. I often have students that, that uh, know quite a lot about the subject matter so I can what, draw on some of their expertise and make the class a bit more interactive. And then the final thing I try to do is I, I try to collaborate with other faculty across the university to come in and give us some of the technical details. And sometimes that works wonderfully, but there's, there's, I feel like I'm only scratching the surface on this kind of interaction and it's wonderful to do it much more because it's really an opportunity in basically all 25, 26 of my classes to have somebody come in and, and, and help for 10 or 15 minutes. And that was actually a question in the Q and A also about the potential use of guest lecturers to cover this material, which is, you know, that comes with pluses and minuses. I mean, it's, it would be nice if, if one could, you know, cover a lot of the technical material that oneself, but on the other hand, you know, maybe, the, maybe having guests coming in is a, is a good way to do it. I certainly use guest lecturers or guest, guest visitors in my class, but at least for my class, they all just come from real world practical realms where we're talking about practical stuff. And Jim, one, just to weigh in on this, I mean, one thing that I've found and in, in also encountering this is really taking a step back and reflecting precisely what do my students need to know, right? Um, it can be very tempting, at least for me, to say, let's jump into the technical details, let's jump in. But sometimes, you know, that's just, that's just not the right approach given the content I'm trying to to teach and so figuring out where that line is um, for me personally has been a challenging because on the one hand I don't want to underrepresent the important work that um, science and technical work is doing but on the other hand I've got a lot of content that I need to cover or want to cover that's about just in my case the politics 
and just figuring out where that line is, um, is you know, that's that, that's a challenge for us to continue to puzzle through. I was just say the, the approach I use is to let the students self-select into how much scientific background they need. So what I do is I make available about a total of six hours of videos if they really want to go through all of that, which they look at before our first class even meets. And some of the students go through a lot and some of them go through virtually none. And then I do a very brief summary of it at, at a pretty basic level that I would understand um, in the first class. Yeah, that's great. It'd be great if, I don't know, some way we could uh, follow up on this with dropping some of those links in or something along those lines so that others could, could look at it. So, so Myra, we've been talking a little bit about the science side of things and the econ side of things. Um, you come from the divinity school. Uh, we often think, I mean, it, it, it's not, it's natural for many people to think of climate change as being about science, economics, policy, social challenges. Uh, how does the humanities, teaching in the humanities fit into climate education? That's, that's a fantastic question. And I think that the climate change is, is a, both an existential and an ethical question, right? And the, and you know, it goes to the heart of questions of what does it even mean to be talking about the possibility of the destruction of the world? <clears throat> and, and how should anybody live in this particular moment? And so, so in the humanities, we're thinking about how to retell histories, human histories that have for so long ignored ecological histories and those that we have learned through those histories habits of thinking, right? Um, that, that we now have to, to learn new habits of thinking. And, and I think the, the, another dimension that is very important is what are the linguistic dimensions? What, are, what is the kind of language we use to talk about it and what does it convey? What are the philosophical concepts with which we, we um, think and what are the things, how, how do philosophical concepts can even hide the material dimensions of existence? Um, and also to take seriously the imagination, right? When something as uh, drastic, such a dramatic change is happening, we reach for the imagination um, to try to think about something that is almost unthinkable. And I think the humanities have a lot to offer in these areas. In my, my particular class is focused on areas of colonialism and race, which is the area I typically teach. Um, but I'm now in this class integrating this question of how the history of colonialism and racism are also histories of environmental degradation. And the flip side of that is how do people who are interested in overcoming the legacies of colonialism and racism, um, the way it structures our knowledges, um, should be interested in questions of of environmental and climate change. Um, so I, I invite students to do research. It's a very research heavy course in which students are invited to do research on the ecological history, ecological intersecting with the political histories of particular places they are interested in. Uh, and these are most often places they value, they have some affective connection to. Um, and it's a fantastic opportunity for them to deepen their knowledge about what has happened through history in these places, um, but also students to teach each other about a variety of dynamics in different areas of the, of the world. You started off in this point, which it's, as we think about the craft of teaching, we think about our substance areas, and especially for those of us who work, you know, more or less, if this is what we do, uh, mm -hmm. we tend to think it's it's easy to forget about um, 
sort of the emotional side of this mm -hmm. and, and how students are, are approaching this. But there's an awful lot of, uh, there's, a, there's I, I find, you know, if, if you listen, this, so listening to emotions is not what economists are really known for. But if you, you know, do your best, uh, um, there's an awful lot going on. I mean, there's a combination of a, a lot of anger, a lot of anger among the students at our, my generation uh, for you know, not being, you know, responsible and solving problems and demanding that those actions be taken. There's um, a, a lot of energy for in some that energizes some people. And, in, you know, we certainly have leaders on our campus who have been doing climate demonstrations and demanding different actions and leading, leading student strikes, but also working, you know, as scientists and engineers, pushing forward knowledge and coming up with things. But it also leads to, at least for some, a sense of despair uh, and a sense of, um, you know, really worrying about a feeling of loss of the future. How do we, how do we, I, this is kind of a hard question for a Zoom thing, but like, how do we deal with that in the classroom? And it's not, maybe I can deal with that with my 12 students in a freshman seminar where we all get to know each other pretty well. And then we can have a conversation towards the end of the semester. But, but that's a subtext in much of what we teach. Mm -hmm. So I can say something about how I think I tried to deal with it, Jim. So 25 years ago, I wrote something called um, Harnessing Market Forces to Protect the Environment. And the way I view what I do now in the classroom is harnessing the forces of students' hearts to protect the environment and address climate change. So it's not substituting hard thinking for what people care about. It's giving tools of hard thinking in order to achieve the objectives that their hearts want them to achieve. And I make it clear from day one, I, I don't know if everyone likes this, that if at the end of the course, students know whether or not I'm an environmental tree hugger or an industry apologist, then I have failed. <laughs> that they should not know what my particular perspective is. And if they want to come at it, they want to learn environmental economic or these economic tools to do a better job representing private industry, much of which private industry is very constructive on climate change, I would add, and helpful, then that's fine. If they want to use it to go to the Natural Resources Defense Council or Sierra Club, then that's also fine. I'm going to provide them with some tools that I hope are helpful. You know, I taught my last lecture today in the Politics of Climate Change course. And we actually decided to have a big part of the conversation be precisely about this, Jim, um, especially studying politics. I mean, people say economics is the dismal science. You know, try, try studying politics. Um, and, you know, the way that um, Stephen Soliver here and I framed it was that, that um, it's the, the politics of what's possible and that there are mechanisms for having influence um, uh, it, this is a big challenge, right? And, and you know, the, it's not been in sort of learning technical tools, but learning about, you know, how do you form coalitions, right? Um, uh, how do you um, uh, create new parties, right? Um, how do you not treat the future as fixed, right? Um, and at the same time, layering in, you know, the different sort of justice issues. So, you know, I'm familiar with Lucas's course and someday Lucas, I'm gonna take your course, um, but layering in some of those things so that we make sure that we're thinking about issues of justice when we are talking about solutions, right? Solutions for who? Um, and then, you know, finally, I think it's also just helpful in some sense to kind of uh, reframe things. Like Jim Henson has this from the Muppets has this great quote that's something like, you know, we don't, um, we don't, we don't inherit the earth, you know, from our forefathers. We're borrowing it from our children, right? And I think that type of framing that, like, the, we can do things that are actually good for the future, not just for ourselves, but for future generations, that can have a mobilizing effect, right? And and I, so I think that there's a sort of mobilization opportunity that comes out of some of this despair. And the despair is real, it's anxiety, it's fear. It is real in our students. Um, and I think we're here to offer them the potential to, to change that future. It's not fixed. 
In my my class names catastrophe explicitly. So we we start talking about kind of frames to think about catastrophe and what kind of affects they communicate, certain types of narrative communicate. And that I think is an important way of giving depth to the to the to the discussions. I think also an important part of the class is we read um, narratives of catastrophe related to colonialism and, and slavery. So actual um, stories in order to give a longer history also of devastation. Um, it doesn't sound like a, you know, a shift in, in the affective dimension, but it does give it more of a historical depth um, so that in, in facing the possibilities and the inevitability of catastrophe today, there's also a sense of a longer history um, that, that we're dealing, even as some of the challenges are unprecedented. There's a question in the chat or in the Q&A that's on sort of a this theme. It's, I'll just read the question. When teaching climate change, which is not lacking solutions or idea, but merely will or daring to dream, how do you entice critical thinking and imagination to allow students to imagine a better world where we would collectively all stand up and actively act individually and collectively upon climate change? Again, that's a hard subtext, right? I mean, we, we all are good at teaching technical things or reading books and so forth. That's a tough, that's a tough high level question. Well, this is probably an excessively technical response, but one of the ways that we do it is by giving students an opportunity to construct alternative simulations of future paths, uh, whether it's to achieve some objective like two degrees C maximum temperature increase during the century or 1.5, and sometimes it's to identify a cost-effective uh, path, um, give them the opportunity to push up against the frontiers of what's possible and then to see, wait, the binding constraint is technology and then they can start thinking about alternative technologies. I think this is a, a, a very big issue that runs through teaching virtually any dimension, climate change from an ethical perspective. And I also had my last lecture and in, in the course uh, today, and it's, 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 it's always a bittersweet ending and, and, and a struggle not to end on a, on a depressing note. But I think I, I basically have two strategies to help, um, or anyway, to try to help people manage their despair and anger. One, I think the antidote, the antidote can't be just to um, offer hopeful, but in some ways, Blind, opt blindly optimistic kind of victory stories that in the long run are really a drop in the bucket, but rather to try to teach the dimensions of climate change, the ethical, political, social, technological problems from a very historically expansive perspective that helps students appreciate that the energy transition is not going to happen next year or five years or 10 years from now. It will take a very long time, and the character and shape that it will take will depend on, as Dustin says, um, how politics in very different political systems play out, whether in international institutions are built to overcome the collective action problems at the global level, and many other things besides. But a second thing that I try to do is um, to use a distinction or a tool for, from political philosophy to help students understand their anger. And what the one of that one of those distinctions is the distinction between um, ideal theory and non-ideal theory. When we ask questions in ideal theory, we're ultimately asking what should all of us together do? The entire world, assuming everyone simply wants to do the right thing, do right by future generations, do right by the young, and so on. But we shift to a different mode of reasoning and a different perspective when we ask what should some of us, you and I, do, given that not everyone is presently motivated. To live together how we all together should and some of the people who have long held power have 
use that power to block efforts at meaningful climate reform. That helps people to focus the question that they're asking to identify the implied audience and the implied criti critics, uh, the, sorry, the implied, the implied objects of their moral indignation and criticism and we can structure dis discussions around that. Yeah, I really struggle with this, both the, this, I mean, these are related, the emotions and also the trying to imagine something better as I am confronted constantly with the numbers and the predictions. Um, and uh, it's something that I definitely have a difficult, difficulty handling in my class from the science perspective where I'm like, the numbers don't lie. This is like, it's bad. You know, one thing that we talk about, though, I mean, from a perspective of our students, our students are, um, you know, looking ahead to careers and lives where they're engaged as citizens and engaged as professionals in this area. And, you know, this is going to be, a, uh, there's going to be huge opportunities for doing really good things uh, in the world as we make this transition. We're going to have to make this energy transition, really. The question is, when we do it, or do we do it in enough time to mitigate damages? So whether you're an engineer and you're really interested in, you know, whatever cool, you know, new project, you know, product it is, that's an important thing to do if you're interested in carbon sequestration, that's a really carbon dioxide removal. That's a really, that's, there's going to be, you know, a huge potential uh, demand for those sorts of things. Or if you're, um, you know, if you want to work for a company and you're interested in sustainability type issues, companies are going to have an important role to play. Uh, and we'll have, you know, really large roles to play if you're thinking about being a design professional and you want to, you know, work on making all design professionals are going to have to think about how to make buildings more resilient and in, and urban infrastructures more resilient and greener and all of that thing. It's like it's like this is the way of the future. So there is an exciting opportunity to build professional careers while you're doing while you're making progress on this, as well as uh, taking advantage of the fact that we're going to be spending trillions of dollars, so I'm giving a sort of a, a, a you know a positive a positive story about how our students, being as smart as they are and being the leaders that they are, are going to be able to make a difference and have uh, constructive careers of addressing these challenges. And so we need to provide them with the right tools. Maybe we're going to shift back to some of the more. Uh, mechanical questions rather than focus on this sort of these, these really difficult questions. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is a great question. We got a great question from uh, Elizabeth Losos, who's uh, at the, uh, uh, at the Nicholas Institute at Duke. And she's asking a, a great, uh, a great administration type question for Dustin. Is the curriculum committee thinking about the goals of the, the goals, uh, excuse me, is the curriculum committee thinking about what the goals the university should have concerning climate education and how will it measure progress and success? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, absolutely thinking about the goals. And I think just to sort of rehash, you know, one of the goals is to not simply think that um, our educational offering is solely going to be um, uh, mediated through classwork, right? It's going to be an important part. Um, but I think we want to really make sure that we're really treating the student experience as a much more of a holistic one, um, which actually ties into a separate question I'll get to in a second about, you know, what are examples of co-curricular um, and extracurricular type opportunities, but I'll get, uh, which is a separate question I'll get there in a second. Um, in terms of, you know, metrics and evaluation, I think, you know, those derive from those goals. So simply doing a bean count of how many classes mention the word climate change in our syllabus this year and in the future years. Yes, we can measure that. Yes, we should measure that. But that doesn't capture our aspirations, I don't think. Um, I think other things capture our aspirations. Um, uh, what, you know, how many of our students are going out and uh, getting jobs or internships or, 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 or going into the sciences or whatever, like, you know, let's, what happens after Harvard in a sense, that's an important metric. I think there are other metrics. When we have um, employers come to our job fairs, how many of them are making explicit offerings? Yes, we have positions in the climate space. That's a great metric because it's a metric that we can, you know, potentially you know, nudge those organizations and say, look, our students are interested in this. Make sure that um, you're, you're offering these things. Um, so I think that the type of metrics 
the specifics are to be determined. Um, but I think we, we were definitely thinking beyond just a sort of a bean counting, you know, type exercise um, there. I also think another great metric is, you know, what's the, what's the scope of the kind of co-curricular and extracurricular type opportunities? We have the ability to count those things. We fund those things administratively. Um, but what do they look like? And I think there are some great models that are emerging. Um, I've been involved in one called uh, Fellows at the Forefront. What it is, is it's a group of undergraduates. Um, half of them work with me doing research on topics in political science and economics that I study. Another half um, are uh, embedded out in the field in different organizations like Green for All, um, National Resources Defense Council, et cetera. But then each week we're all meeting together as a group. This happens over the summer. We're all meeting together as a group and people are sharing their experiences. You know, I was doing this for Professor Tingley. That relates to the work that you're doing in your organization. It gets them talking. We have a speaker series. Um, uh, Jim Stock was a, a, a speaker um, uh, last year. I'm looking to my colleagues on this call. I'd love to line you up. Um, but the point is just getting that crosstalk between the sort of more academic side of work that people are doing, but also people that are out there experiencing it and having that happen you know, at the same time, right? It's over the same summer. And importantly, it's a shared experience. It's a social experience. It's not something divorced from who these students are as actual people. They're getting to know each other. Um, so that's just a, you know, attempt to answer one of the other questions, but, you know, how do we keep track of those things? Are we seeing more of those opportunities? Um, how can we provide them? I think that those are the sorts of metrics that are, are going to be very valuable as we um, chart our progress. I'd say the final metric, and maybe this is a little bit more aspirational, maybe this is a little bit arrogant Harvard-esque, but how can we influence the rest of the educational landscape, right? What are things that we can be doing at our institution that other institutions um, can be leveraging, whether it's even including like working with standard setting type organizations. And likewise, how do we learn from others? I actually think it would be a great thing if in two years I'm able to come back to Vice Provost Stock and say, we implemented these three things that were great ideas from Columbia, these three things that were great ideas from the University of Chicago, and these three things that were great from Mercer Community College. Right, because there are going to be great ideas around, and Harvard should be in a position where we welcome the innovations that are happening in the rest of the educational space. And we recognize that um, there are great ideas out there that we should act upon. There's another question in chat. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that. There's another question, or a couple of questions in chat that get back to this question of the basic science, uh, how do you teach, you know, what, do you, what do you know about the basic science and so forth? And Lucas had a set of uh, suggestions and a set of approaches and Rob had this other set of approaches, which is have people watching the videos, which is, you know, that strikes me as being pretty good too. Um, you know, another possibility, if we try to think where we should be, let's call it like four or five years from now or three or four or five years from now, should we just be able, should Rob and Lucas just be able to expect that there's this fundamental knowledge that everybody has? Um, you know, are we going to, would we have a required course? I, we're not going to answer that question because that's presumably one of the things that Dustin's committee is thinking about. That's a really complicated question at Harvard. But, you know, there's another question in chat that says, like, what's the minimum that everybody should know? What should everybody who's graduating from Harvard know about climate science and those are all those are related related questions what do we think about that what i i'm really curious about what people think about that question and of course climate is really big right climate covers everything but you know they've also got to learn english and they've got to learn a lot of other topics too so you can't be too greedy so i'll jump in and say something about economics and, and I'm also thinking politics, but that's Dustin's area, that in addition to understanding the basics of climate science, I would hope that students would understand the fundamentals of, an econo of economic thinking about climate change, that there are trade-offs, that there are more than one way to skin a cat, that we can do it in an expensive way, we can do it in a cheaper way, and we care not only about climate change and not only about the environment, we care about the cost of food and education and healthcare and everything else, so there are ways to do it smarter. 
And that I think is fundamental. And the other, but I'll turn to Dustin for this, that, but it's very important in my course is to recognize that ultimately the science takes us to the economics, both spatially and temporally. And then both of those take us to the, ge the politics and the geopolitics. And that's really what's fundamental is the domestic politics and the international geopolitics. I, I think that's right. Um, you know, but I, let me let me give an example and then tee up Marianne and get her thoughts. Let me give an example of something that, to be frank, I didn't understand sufficiently until I started working in this space over the past, say, five years. That has that's a scientific thing that has profound political implications, which is the CO two that we've already admitted. We've already dialed in a fair bit of warming already. That is something that I sufficiently did not understand until Dan Schrag at the University Center for the Environment started beating me over the head with it. And it has profound political implications, right? It has profound political implications. And so hitting people with that and helping them understand CO2, both in its sort of insulation blanket in the atmosphere, but also how it's changing the ocean and being absorbed there or not absorbed, et cetera, um, that, that has a big implication. We're dialed in for some degree of warming, right? Unless, as my colleague David Keith would say, we resort to something like geoengineering or do something like carbon sequestration, both of which come with risks and, and different price tags and so on and so forth. But that political fact is like, we are already going to have warming and here's the science of that. And here are the political implications that come from that. To me is a great example of, I want my students to understand the, the, just the basic science that goes into that sheer fact. And then that helps open up the conversation about why that is politically relevant. But Mariana, I'm sure there are other things, you would nod in your head, but I'm sure there are other things that you would say, this is what your students need to know. <laughs> I'm obviously biased because I think the science, the fundamental science is really important. But uh, I think understanding the basics of just the very basic understanding of the greenhouse effect and greenhouse gases and that aspect that you just emphasized, the fact that CO2 is an extremely long lived substance. So whatever you emit now will matter a um, hundred years from now, 200 years from now. So uh, that's one thing that I think all of our students should know. Uh, just in terms of literacy and being able to understand sort of the basics of what we're facing. I also think that it's really important for students to understand. I talked about this a little bit when I was talking about active learning, um, variability. So we talk about two degrees of warming. What does two degrees of warming look like? Well, Oceans have a lot more heat capacity than land. So it's gonna be a lot more warming over land than over ocean. So what does that actually look like? I mean, we're gonna lose two thirds of our biodiversity of insects. What's the price tag for two thirds of our insect biodiversity? I don't know, right? Like when we talk about economics, I find these things very difficult because I don't know how to put a number on that. But um, I think thinking about the, um, what two degrees actually means. You have this incredible variation in terms of what you see in the Arctic versus what you see at the equator. And it's impacting indigenous peoples in the Arctic particularly strongly. You have, I mean, it's devastating. Um, there are towns that are going to have to be just completely abandoned because the ice will no longer protect them from the winter storms. There will be no ice. Um, so I think there's this aspect of, yeah, two degrees of warming, 1.5 degrees of warming, global warming that needs to be personalized a lot more. Uh, and I think the students need to understand that. Again, going back to a few of the questions here, sort of thinking about sort of weaving a few of them together. One of the things that's going to be, uh, that we know, we know is that the future is going to be different than the present. And 
that means we need to be able to prepare our students. And we don't exactly, we can make guesses. And Mariana's, Mariana's talking about some of those modeling exercises, but there's a lot of uncertainty also in that. So, and we aren't going to be able to know exactly how those play out. So how do, how, how does preparing, how does preparing our students for this changing and uncertain future play into this? I'll maybe just connect it to what I was going to say to respond to the last question. Yeah, I, I endorse everything that was said in response to that question and would just add that um, it's, it's crucial, I think, for students who graduate from college these days to understand not just the climate science facts, but essential facts about the energy transition and what it will take globally to, to transform uh, the global energy system. Facts like emissions continue to grow and Fossil fuel infrastructure is not being displaced by renewables, but rather humanity's energy supply is being augmented by renewables. Uh, global population growth continues and consumption growth continues and so on, because that helps introduce different, um, as Bob Staben said, different, different trade-offs that are at issue between adaptation and mitigation between present generation welfare and future generation welfare and so on. Um, and of course, a lot of these impacts in the future are profoundly uncertain. So if you're connected to the climate science, so a, a lot of the, the tipping points that we may hit after two degrees of warming or even before that positive feedback mechanisms and so on. My understanding is that the modeling and the science behind them does not allow us to assign precise probability distributions. And so there is a general moral question for decision making here. How should societies, voters, legislators, international negotiators make decisions under conditions of profound Nightian uncertainty about potentially civilizationally catastrophic risk, but that we uh, you know, that, that, that are simply not as amenable to standard decision theory and cost-benefit analysis as other kinds of problems. That, I think, is just an extraordinarily difficult philosophical problem, and it's helpful for us to get an appreciation of different approaches to this question and the way that disagreements about this question drive disputes about the urgency of acting on climate change. I think, I think also the very question of what does uncertainty mean? Right, Marie, when Mariana was talking about modeling, I was thinking this is a great opportunity uh, for someone to, to learn in a more concrete way what uncertainty means. Um, but I think a, a, a direct ap approach to this question of uncertainty, which so often gets used in so many different ways, uh, is... Fantastic. I think also, I'm thinking about the work of Amitav Ghosh, a writer who's written um, kind of a history of the novel in which he argues how gradually we lost a tradition of writing that dealt with the catastrophic um, in, in ways that might then hinder our imagination such that certain events, because they're not predictable um, in, with any certainty, then just are outside of what we imagine and thus can, can even think of preparing for, right? A hundred year flooding uh, in order to, to make a decision to move from that area, you really have to contemplate that something that is catastrophic and unheard of can actually happen. Well, can I add something that we've missed that I saw come up in the chat and people are hmm. asking about, they were asking about what about impacts on non-white people and non-white parts of the world? And something that's very important and it's one of the ways in which courses, my own course, and I'm sure others have evolved over time, is that whereas economists have traditionally spend a lot of their time looking at efficiency and cost effectiveness, um, increasingly, certainly in the climate change realm, but in all other realms as well, we look at distributional equity. Mm -hmm. 
And in the climate change realm, domestically, this is either what's referred to as environmental justice, typically for correlated air pollutants, uh, impacts on low income communities, and also what's referred to as just transition, which is that, for example, Appalachian coal miners are going to be losing their jobs and have a lack of mobility. And then as importantly, and a huge part of my course certainly is in the international realm, uh, rather than efficiency and cost effective being the driving forces of international policy, such as the Paris Climate Agreement, it is distributional equity. It's common but differentiated responsibilities. That you know phrase that goes back to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's what drives the policy is distributional equity. And the 150 developing countries compared to the relatively small number of 30, 35 of the wealthier countries, they're the ones that to a large degree are really advancing the international schedule of action. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, I, you know, it's also just to go back to our students, um, it's an area where our students uh, feel a profound um, uh, uh, responsibility and interest and, um, you know, uh, I'll give you a quick example. When we were designing uh, our climate change and politics course, we workshopped it with some undergrads and they said, wait, why are you putting the environmental justice stuff in the last three weeks of the course? That should be on day two or day one. We changed it. We put it on day three, had to do some other things first for other reasons. We put it on day three and it fundamentally changed the tone and tenor of the conversation. And I'm convinced it made it a much better class. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's there, it's good pedagogy. It's good from a sort of a moral um, perspective. And it's also, as Rob is pointing out, it's the reality of what's on the ground. So we should absolutely be doing that. And it's also a good practice of learning from your students. Yep. So, Okay, well, thank you very much. We have reached the end of our hour, and I appreciate all of you taking the time, and thank you very much for the audience for pitching in. Melissa, do you have some final words? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to all of our panelists for this very important and sobering conversation. And thanks to all of you who joined us today. We hope you'll join us for more signature events. Information about upcoming events, as well as recordings of our past ones, can be found at vpal.harvard.edu slash vpal dash events. Good night, everyone. And thank you for being a part of the conversation.